Welcome to this week's edition of Outdoors Online, a weekly webcast produced by the North Dakota Game and Fish Department. I'm your host, Tom Jensen. Dave Frieda is the fishery supervisor in Riverdale, manages pretty much the Missouri River system from the Montana border, Lake Sakakawea, the river all the way down to Stanton. Dave, um, I want to start off, it's been kind of an odd spring as far as weather goes. We've had very mild temperatures, very little moisture. How's that going to affect your particular fisheries? Well, we have obviously got on the water a little earlier and it's been somewhat better working conditions in a lot of years. Even we've had a lot of a lot of wind, but, um, you know, we got started a little early. Uh, but honestly, it's not like our spawning season is extremely early, um, at least in the Missouri River system. Our pike and walleyes, they may they may spawn a little bit earlier, but it's primarily daylight driven and stuff. So, you know, we really haven't started any walleye spawning yet. Um, pike is there you know still in the process too so right your district is probably affected more by snowpack and particularly mountain snowpack as far as your water levels go and we haven't had much snowpack how is that going to affect say Lake Sakakawea? Well two things kind of play into the Missouri River system overall our water management there's 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 plain snowpack which is our local runoff that's that's kind of the critical stuff it comes off early when we need it during the spawning season. That that typically gives us that rise during that May period, April and May, um, when we need it during the spawn. That that's that critical first bump. And then mountain snowpack ultimately that that kind of drives a system on on where we end up for a high for the summer overall water. And and obviously the plains are dry. I mean nobody. It, it's no secret to anybody that we have very little to no local runoff at this point. So. We're probably not going to see much rise unless we get a real change in, in rain patterns. Uh, the snowpack had been pretty pretty poor most of the winter. Um, there had been some improvements lately, um, but realistically, we're not we're coming into spring with good water levels. But I don't anticipate a, a very good rise during the spawn at this point unless things change, and we're probably not going to see a real rise in, in the reservoir this summer. Several years ago, <clears throat> Dave, the Missouri River tail race below Garrison Dam. Uh, was the place to be for fishing in the spring. It was really good. How about this year? You know, things are coming back a little bit. Uh, obviously, it was exceptional right after 2011 when we had a lot of entrained fish down there and a lot of fish were just there for the food coming through. And it was very good fishing. And then, you know, the last few years, we've settled into kind of a lull after, you know, we had some definite forage crashes and um, habitat changes that really kind of lagged in the fishery. but. We're, we're seeing nicer fish now this this spring, finally up here. Part of it is the river, uh, the forage has been supplemented a lot in the river, probably not as much productivity in the river itself, but we had ex extremely good smelt reproduction on Skakawea in 2014, and we've seen just millions and millions of smelt going through the dam, and, and that's really benefited the, the river system all the way down, and even like this spring, you know, smelt are showing up and stomachs of walleyes, you know, Bismarck and below and down. So uh, a lot of the forage recovery we think is due to that Sakakawea contributions, but it's made a difference, definitely. Sure, let's talk about Lake Sakakawea itself, Dave, as far as the health mm. overall, mm. fish populations, uh, spawning and that kind of thing. Overall, things are very good right now. Um, our smelt abundance is extremely high, the highest since we started you know, standardized surveys in the, in the late 90s. We got a lot of forage out there. We got exceptional sport fish populations. Our walleye abundance is the second highest since the reservoir went in. So we have a lot of walleyes out there. Um, the, the caveat to that is, <clears throat> you know, last summer the fishing was pretty good, but with that extremely abundant smelt forage, you know, sometimes a bite can be a little tougher. Um, this year, though, there is just there is a lot of walleyes out there, and uh, it sh it should be good. They're in good shape, and so there's no shortage if they go on the bite. All right. You mentioned the smelt uh, spawn, Dave. We need fairly steady water levels for the smelt spawn, don't we? At the very least, steady, but preferably rising during that critical, you know, April 20th, uh, May 15th period, roughly. It, it's critical to have that um, smelt spawn in just a few inches of water, typically. Um, this spring, we're we have good water levels, you know, we're, we're at a good level coming into the spring. It's just, I don't anticipate a good rise during that period. Um, we'll see. You never know how things will change quickly though. Sure. A lot so. of people don't realize the wind can affect that smelt spawn too, right? Oh, certainly. When you get a big wind event shortly after the spawn and those eggs are in just a, a 
you know, a few inches of water and most people realize how violent Sakakawea can get with waves. You get, you know, four or five foot waves pounding in. It's, it's, it's definitely tough on the eggs, so. All right, let's go through your fish species, Dave, which you have a lot of and start with uh, walleyes. Yeah, like I mentioned, walleyes are, <clears throat> you know, they're at the second highest level that we've ever documented. So there's a lot of walleyes and there'll be a lot of 15 to 20 inch fish out there, a lot of desirable sized fish for anglers. Uh, probably not as many bigger fish as people were used to a few years back, but uh, they're, they're coming along. The abundance is there. The abundance is there and a lot of nice harvestable fish that people want. Most of the uh, fishery supervisors I've talked to, Dave, when I mentioned Northern Pike, they all seem to get pretty happy. Our abundance of pike on Skakwea has definitely come down from the high of a few years ago. Um, we had that great reproduction after the lake came back in 2009. So we're, we're coming down, but the size structure is definitely up. There's there's a lot of nice 15 to 20 pound pike in Skakwea now. And there is some small stuff coming up too, but overall pike population is very good. So. Uh, one species that you have in abundance in Lake Skakwea, Dave, that uh, really doesn't get fish for a lot is smallmouth bass. Yeah, it has very good smallmouth population. Um, you know, there is a few people target them, but not very many. But, you know, the vast majority are caught when people are fishing for walleyes, and they tend to, at times of the year, be in the same structure. But, yeah, there's, you know, a few years ago, there was a record number of whoppers caught out of Skakawea. So, yeah, that's definitely that. And another species that's just vastly underutilized is catfish. We, you know, from one end of the reservoir to the other, there is an abundance of catfish that go vastly underutilized too. So. Uh, salmon, let's talk about that. Okay, well we, this fall the spawning run uh, was a little slow for females. We did, you know, we, we struggled a little bit with egg take, but the bright side to that was there was a, a very high proportion of the run was age one males or what we call jacks. They mature a year younger than the females will the first time. So we we anticipate this coming year there should be a lot of a lot of fish from that same year class showing up. Um, you know that's the first sign we've seen in a few years that we got a strong strong salmon component coming on. So hopefully that that transpires into into good fishery this summer. Stocking efforts going to be about the same. Uh, in 2015 we stocked almost a record number. We did about 400,000. This coming year it'll be down some. We didn't take quite the eggs we wanted to. So. But we still we still got enough for a good stocking when conditions are right, more than enough to produce a fishery. Obviously, the future is fairly bright for Sakaka. We are right now. Do you anticipate any major changes or anything this summer? No, uh, things are good right now coming in the spring. But you know, with dry conditions on the horizon, things can change in a hurry. Um, where we're at a year from now will be more of a more than you know more important than where we're at right now, I guess, uh, after if we continue dry through the summer. The bright spot is though that we have great fish population out there and and honestly if we went into a dry period for a couple of years and it wasn't extended, it could really benefit the angler because fish tend to go on a bite with dropping water or lower water levels and Sakakawea fish is harder during high periods. So, you know, a short term drying spell wouldn't be bad for the angler. So you uh, have a multitude of things that you can do this time of year as far as fishing goes, Dave. I'm going to ask you a question here. If you could take the day off, go fishing somewhere in your district uh, and fish for any species in your district, where would you go and what would you do? Uh, this time of year, obviously pike on Skakawea. That's what I prefer to do this time. Yeah, pick a bay and throw some smelt out. So, right From the sound of things, uh, the chances that you'd get a pretty good sized pike are pretty good. Yeah, I'm, there's no reason a 15 pound plus pike is fairly common. So. All right, Dave, thanks. Now we move on to our report from the Red River and its supervisor, Todd Caspers. Todd, uh, the Red is a little bit different in that it's co-managed with Minnesota. Does that bring up any issues of any kind? Um, not really any issues. It's, I mean, since it's a border water, we manage the resource with Minnesota DNR. Um, and basically what that entails is we cooperate with them on things like the fish population surveys, which we generally do every five years, and then creel surveys as well. And we just had a creel survey and the fish population survey this past summer. All right, let's talk about the Red River itself and the fishing on the river. It's really a diverse fishery in that it has a lot of species. Yeah, there's many different species such as channel catfish, walleye, sauger, northern pike, 
Um, in, in addition to a lot of non-game species as well, such as freshwater drum and carp and um, gold eye as well, yeah. and others as well. Yeah, a new species that's not very welcome in that an aquatic nuisance species called zebra mussels. Yeah, that's tr that's true. We discovered um, adult zebra mussels in the river this past summer. We had we had gotten hits off our you know our villager sampling for the sort of baby mussels, so to speak, before in the upper portions of the river. But we just documented that there are adults pretty much throughout the river now as well. So everybody's going to have to be diligent about you know following the ANS regulations to try to minimize the chances that those get spread around. Sure. Todd, let's talk about these fish species in the Red River, the fishable species, and let's talk about them one at a time. Concentrate, first of all, on the bread and butter fish for the Red River, the catfish. Yeah, I mean, the channel catfish is one of the, like you said, the bread and butter species on the Red River. It's actually one of the best channel cat fisheries probably in North America in terms of size of channel catfish that you can catch. I mean, a 20-pound channel catfish is not all that unusual in northern portions of the Red River. Um, generally, kind of as a general rule, you get more channel catfish in the southern portions or the upstream portions of the river, but as you move farther north and further downstream, the, the channel cats get less abundant, but usually a little better size. So. Okay. There's times of the year, Todd, that you actually have some world-class walleye fishing too, big fish. Yeah, there are, you know, the, the springtime spawning run is usually a good time to catch some of those nicer walleyes, but in the fall people catch walleyes as well. Sort of all summer long you might be able to catch some walleyes, so it's a, you know, a pretty good population. Northern pike? Um, northern pike aren't as well known on the red, but there are certainly fishable population of northern pike. Okay, any panfish to speak of in the red? Uh, any pan fishing? Not really that you know you hear much about. Uh, they're just pretty much overtaken by the catfish and the walleye fishing. Yeah, I mean most people that fish on the red are after walleye or, or channel catfish or you know sauger times too. Right. There has been some construction on the Red River the last 10 years that I can remember uh, mostly removing low head dams and for safety purposes uh, I would assume. Is that going to affect the fishing at all on the on the river? Some fish passages? Um, uh, yeah if anything it should should benefit the fish populations on the river. Um, you know those low head dams are of course a safety hazard but they are preventing fish passage a lot of times too except in really high water so when those dams were taken out and modified for fish passage that makes it easier for fish to have access to more of the river so that's a good thing for the fish populations. All right I'll ask you the same question I asked Dave Todd if you could take a day off of work if you could go fishing any place on the Red River uh, where would you go and what would you do? Oh, it's a little early yet, maybe, but I'd probably try to, to catch a few walleyes, I think, maybe below the below the Riverside Dam and Grand Forks. I'd probably give that a try. Oh. All right. Todd, thanks. Thank you. If you plan to fish any of the lakes mentioned in Outdoors Online, or actually nearly every lake in North Dakota for that matter, the new March-April edition of North Dakota Outdoors magazine is an invaluable tool. The special fishing edition has information on almost every fishable lake in the state, including fish species contained in a body of water, directions on how to get to the lake from the nearest town, and whether or not the lake has boating access. You can also find that information at the Game and Fish website at gf.nd.gov, plus there are topographical maps of most lakes available at the website too. For Dave and Todd and the rest of the staff here at North Dakota Game and Fish, thanks for joining us for Outdoors Online. We'll see you again next week.